In terms of science fiction fandom, well, as always, uh, we had television programs. Uh, not a ton of them that were great, but you know, with the with the uh, release of Star Wars, everybody wanted to get on a project. Uh, project UFO, Logan's Run, which was a TV series that they made into a uh, um, a, uh, a TV series, it was a movie. Oh, this one, that one when it rolls around again. Believe it or not, they tried to do Doctor Strange. That was from Doctor Strange TV. They also had Spider Man on TV as a TV series. Uh, there's Leia in there. Yeah. They had the Incredible Hulk in a TV series. Battlestar Galactica was now a TV series. The Man from Atlantis about a merman was a TV series. And the New Avengers was out there. Uh, yeah, Larry says Jim Backus died soon after the last Gilligan's Island special. Yeah, he was not even in uh, the Harlem Glo Globetrotters one. His uh, supposed son, Thurston Howell III, whom we'd never heard of before, was in that. You see here, Quark, that was another one. Wonder Woman was another one. Um, these were all stuff that, again, to some extent were influenced by the fact that, hey, Star Wars is huge. We need to get, like, superheroes and stuff like that. Now, some of them predated Star Wars, but a lot of this was a reaction to the fact that Star Wars was big and studios and network execs said, holy crap, we got to get us some science fiction, and so they did. In terms of films, well, as always... Sturgeon's Law holds. We had a lot of science fiction films starting to come out. Again, on the heels of Star Wars, everybody, all of the studios went, oh my God, we have to have some science fiction. So you're seeing some here that are bad. The Cat from Outer Space. I don't know about the Medusa Touch. I've never looked at it. Uh, yeah, I've never seen that one either. Death Sport, which is remembered by some people. Uh, Space 1999, Larry, Larry had uh, finished up by then. It was, I think, 1974, 75. So that was gone by then. Oh, Kiss. Kiss meets the Phantom of the Park. Just an excuse to put Kiss into something on TV, and it was terrible. Um, Sturgeon's Law holds 90% of science fiction is crap. And, in fact, 90% of everything is crap. But we have Superman, great one that I'll be reviewing. Uh, War of the Robots, which I won't. Boys from Brazil was interesting. Um, and Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. Uh, that is a great one that I may work in. I might stick that one in the week of Christmas. That might be good. And, of course, the Star Wars Holiday Special. Uh, Swarm with a bunch of bees. Piranha pretty much tells you what that is. Uh, and uh, Warlords of Atlantis. Again, Coma was a pretty good movie. Uh, but all uh, uh, Slithis... Blazer Blast, which I have reviewed, it's terrible. Uh, so again, you know, Sturgeon's Law holds. Ninety percent of it was crap. But again, it was because these studios were going, "Oh my God, we got to get science fiction something out there." Um, so they all worked on that. Now, literature at the time, uh, you know, fan interest was sliding away from literature as the best science fiction around, and more into movies. You know, Star Trek was becoming to be very big by then. Next year, which I'll be reviewing, uh, Star Trek The Motion Picture was out. But at this point, we had pretty much moved away from the magazines. There were some still out there, and they did some still, uh, you know, pr produce short stories and novellas and novels and stuff like that. But for the most part, writers were now moving straight into novels. They were not going anywhere else. And the novels tended to be pretty good. Uh, but the public consciousness in science fiction was moving away from novels and into movies. And as always, fans of this time, we had our fanzines. And these were stuff where people could write their own fan fiction, do their own art. And fortunately, by this time, we had finally started to get away from the mini mimeograph machine. Now, sometimes it was still used. You can see here, sometimes we can still see the blue ink where the mimeograph machine was used, but we started to have uh, photocopiers, Xerox machines, which made it a whole hell of a lot of easier. I've talked before in other Fandom of the Era things about the mimeograph machine. I'm going to talk about it here. But that uh, advancement of the photocopier was a gigantic thing for Fandom. It meant that instead of doing this horrible thing with these drums and purple ink, we could just put them on there and reproduce as many as we wanted. And as always, 
we used fanzines. Uh, they were popular right up until the you know mid 1980s or so, and maybe a little bit later. And there were tons and tons of of them, and they tended to be more Star Trek than anything else at that point. They moved away from being science fiction, general science fiction, more to Star Trek. And you always hoped that you made the money back that it took to print the things in the first place. Uh, you would sell them to your local fan club, like here in Lincoln, Nebraska, Starbase Andromeda, which still meets today. Uh, you would sell it to those guys. If you knew people around the country, you might, you know, do a swap with them or sell something. And now we had just straight up Star Trek conventions. And so you could go to conventions and sell them there. Did you necessarily make back the money? Not necessarily, but you gave it a shot. Uh, Larry, Larry says, Jaws in 1975 made the blockbuster summer movie a staple every year. Yes, it did. And Close Encounters came out in December of 1977. Yeah, but it was still in theaters. This was a time when if a movie was popular, they kept it in theaters. They did not assume, because it didn't exist, that a film was going to be taking most of its, living most of its life as a uh, DVD or Blu-ray. They kept these things in the theaters for a long time because that was the only place you were ever going to see them. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds. <laughs> 